and that was <laughs> this was very much a um trust the process i look i need a tiny little brush I, why do i sing literally everything i don't think it's normal ow am i blind and considering the fact that stars the healthy i knew mm, i fucking knew it Ew. What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if you're interested in true crime, you're interested in makeup, or you're interested in some combination of the two, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. That kind of stuff really does help out the channel and your support is greatly appreciated. However, if what I do here isn't a combination that you're a fan of, no worries. I understand that it's not for everyone. So if the concept is a hard pass for you, feel free to head down to the description box where for your convenience, I've listed some other creators that have covered today's story in a way that perhaps you might enjoy more. Yes, I did that for you because I'm an angel. Anyways, with that, I've said my piece. So why don't we go ahead and get into today's case? Okay, so today's case is interesting. That's for sure. It's definitely going to be one of the more like divisive cases that I've covered on the channel. So I'm going to be very interested to see what your guys' opinions are and where you stand on it. Jenna Lynn Gamble was born on September 19th, 1981 in Mesa, Arizona. She was the second child born to her parents, Kathy and Tom Gamble, with her older brother, Jaron, being born about two and a half years earlier in February of 1978. Now, very early on in Jenna's life, Kathy and Tom decided that their relationship wasn't working and the two of them went their separate ways. Tom moved on and married a woman named Carol and Kathy moved on and married a man named Doug Mauser. And Doug ended up assuming the father role over Jenna and Jaren very, very quickly. By the time Jenna was two and Jaren was five, Kathy and Doug were raising the two of them as if they were their very own. And unlike the stereotypical, like, you're not my real dad kind of relationship that children are always portrayed to have with their step parents. Jenna and Doug actually got along really well. They enjoyed spending time together. Doug was incredibly active in Jenna's life. And the two of them really did seem to have a very strong father-daughter-esque bond. When Jenna was around, I think like eight, her family moved to and settled down in Modesto, California, where Kathy took a job working as an aerobics instructor. And Doug worked some like, high security level job at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which was a federal research facility. And for a while, things seemed fine for the Gamble Mauser clan. It wasn't until Jenna and her brother hit their teens that things seemed to kind of shift with the two of them. Allegedly, Jaron began selling drugs out of the family home during his mid-teens. And Jenna, well, Jenna was in her rebellious era. She was defiant and aggressive and confrontational, which to me, a former teenage girl just sounds like being a teenage girl. But apparently Jenna was like a next level rascal. And because of this, Kathy actually started taking her to see a counselor. And you have to think this was like a super duper last resort because we're talking the wild west that was 90s parenting. And Jenna's counselor actually ended up diagnosing her with oppositional defiant disorder or ODD, which according to the Mayo Clinic is a syndrome that can cause frequent loss of temper, anger, resentment, argumentativeness towards authority figures, vindictive behavior, and just like deliberate attempts to annoy others. Again, I fail to see where this differs from just being a teenager, but maybe that says more about who I was and how I acted as a teenager than anything. So I digress. Now, because of Jenna's ODD, she frequently found herself at odds with her parents. I mean, they argued a lot. Jenna disobeyed them a lot, and this ultimately resulted in Jenna being grounded a lot. Which brings us to the morning of Saturday, October 14th, 1995. Kathy was getting ready to leave for the morning to go and teach one of her aerobics classes. And as she was just about to head out the door, she popped into Jenna's room to 
say bye to her, sure, but she also wanted to remind Jenna that she was grounded and that she was not to leave the house or use the phone at all while she was home alone that day. And with that reminder, Kathy left the house as if it was just any old normal day. But sadly, that day would completely change she and her family's lives forever. It was about one in the afternoon when Kathy got back from teaching her aerobics class to find that the front door of her home was locked. Now, this immediately struck her as odd because their family never locked their house during the day if someone was home. And as we just discussed, according to the terms of Jenna's punishment, she was not supposed to leave the house, which meant that she should be home, which meant that the door should be unlocked. Kathy says that she knew right away in her gut that something was wrong, and that suspicion was confirmed when she made her way into the house to see that Jenna, in fact, was not home. She wasn't home, and she also hadn't left a note to explain where she'd gone. And obviously, people didn't have cell phones back then like they do now, so it wasn't like Kathy could just call her or text her to find out where she was. She did try and ask around to some of the neighbors, but no one she talked to had noticed Jenna leaving the house, nor had anyone noticed anything suspicious that day. A few hours later, when Doug and Jaren finally got home, they took it upon themselves to search the neighborhood and the surrounding area. And while they did this, Kathy called some of Jenna's friends, but no one could find Jenna. None of her friends knew where she was. I mean, she was just gone. By the time the evening rolled around, they realized that they were just in over their heads trying to find Jenna on their own, and they decided that they needed to call police and formally report her missing. And then, for what I'm sure felt like the longest hours of their lives, they waited for something, anything, any information on where Jenna might be. And the following morning, on October 15th, 1995, Jenna's family received the worst phone call a parent could ever receive. Police had found the nude body of a teenage girl in a ditch about 20 miles outside of town. The body had obviously been strangled to death and left along Dry Creek near Waterford, California. And because obviously Kathy and Doug had reported their daughter missing the previous day, police wanted them to come down to the morgue and look to see if perhaps the body that had been recovered was that of their daughter. And I cannot even imagine how horrible that ride to the morgue must have been. On one hand, if that's their daughter's body, obviously it's going to be absolutely devastating. But on the other hand, if it's not, now you've been traumatized by looking at the body of a different murdered young girl while your own daughter's missing, basically slapping you in the face with what your own situation's worst case scenario could turn out to be. Not to mention, you'd also effectively be catapulted right back to square one, having no idea where your daughter is, how to find her, or if she's even okay. It just sounds like such a mindfuck and such a horrible thing to have to experience. And sadly, when Kathy and Doug arrived to the morgue that day, they took one look and had the worst fear a parent could have confirmed. Because the body lying in front of them was, in fact that of 14-year-old Jenna Lynn Gamble. Jenna was found beaten, strangled, and naked in a ditch near a walnut orchard. Thankfully, despite her lack of clothing, it was determined that Jenna hadn't been assaulted. She actually had no defensive wounds on her body and appeared to be fairly clean, especially her feet. And this suggested that she'd been killed somewhere prior and that the responsible party had then transported her body to the ditch where it was ultimately discovered. It was also noted by the medical examiner that Jenna had unusual markings on her thigh, which he identified to be post-mortem pressure marks. And that might seem like a random detail, but I assure you, it's important. Beyond that, there really wasn't much evidence on Jenna's body for police to use to kickstart their investigation. Jenna was laid to rest on Thursday, October 19th, 1995, in like a celebration of life style funeral. Doug and Kathy had initially started planning a more traditional service, but when they spoke to Jenna's best friend, Sarah, she told them that what they were planning was not what Jenna would have wanted. Jenna didn't like it when people were sad, and she would rather people laugh and be happy and celebrate who she was. And while, yes, it's a funeral, it's gonna be sad. But in order to honor Jenna's wishes and with Sarah's help, 
Kathy and Doug revised their plans so that they'd be much more in line with what Jenna would have wanted. And while Jenna's family mourned her loss, police got to work trying to determine who was responsible for her death. Now, as previously stated, they had very little to go on at first. There wasn't a lot of obvious evidence on or around Jenna's body when it was found. So they really had to start digging into Jenna's personal life as much as possible to try and find some answer or clue to go off of. The most obvious jumping off point was to kind of reconstruct what she'd done the day she'd gone missing. So they started by pulling the Mauser's phone records from October 14th to see if, even though she was grounded, if maybe Jenna had spoken to anyone on the phone that day, which surprise, surprise, she had. She'd actually called a few of her friends that morning one of which had been her best friend, Sarah. And when questioned about this call, Sarah was actually able to tell police that Jenna had randomly hung up the phone without warning in the middle of their conversation and never called her back, which was definitely weird. However, when police searched Jenna's room, nothing really stood out to them. Everything in her room and in the home seemed like it was in its normal place. Nothing was broken, nothing was turned over, Nothing even seemed slightly askew. It did not look like any kind of like significant struggle had taken place in the home, which made investigators wonder if maybe initially Jenna had left the house on her own volition. They did kind of start to think they were onto something when they found Jenna's diary, because not only was there an entry from the morning of her murder, but it specifically mentioned her interest in two separate boys. Well, one man and one boy. One was around Jenna's age, which, remember, is 14, and the other person she was writing about was either 18 or 19, so ill. Eventually, police were able to track down both of the boys that Jenna had mentioned in her diary, but in speaking to them, they quickly learned that both of them had airtight alibis for the day that Jenna was killed, which unfortunately left police with very little else to go off of. So from there, they turned their focus inwards towards Jenna's immediate family, which we all know is fairly standard procedure. And they were able to really quickly verify Kathy and Jaren's alibis. Kathy had been teaching an aerobics class, so obviously there were tons of people who could verify her whereabouts for the morning. And a few of their neighbors confirmed seeing Jaren around the neighborhood at times that would have made it impossible for him to be responsible, which just left them with one familial alibi to check out. Since the discovery of Jenna's body, Doug, in particular, had been taking her passing really hard. Like I said before, he'd been in her life for 12 years, and the two of them had always been really, really close. So police were pretty surprised when they couldn't verify his alibi. You see, Doug had told them that on the morning of Jenna's murder, he'd been at work, that he'd left the house shortly after his wife, and that when he'd left, Jenna had been alive and well and cleaning her room. But when police attempted to verify this via the security footage at the lab where Doug worked, they were informed that the security cameras had actually not been operating that day. So then they tried asking the security guard that had been at the gate that morning if maybe they could verify the approximate times that Doug had been at the office that day. But unfortunately for Doug, the security guard had absolutely no recollection of him coming or going to or from the lab at all that day. Uh oh. And to make matters worse, when pressed about this further, Doug himself could not even venture a guess as to which security guard had been working that morning. So, like, it kind of seemed like he actually hadn't been at work, but never fear because Doug was not short on backup alibis. Following the disillusion of his first one, he told police that he'd been having lunch at a local fast food restaurant at the exact time that Jenna would have gone missing. And, <laughs> You ain't gonna believe this shit. When police went to try and verify Doug's second alibi with the CCTV footage from the restaurant, their cameras weren't recording that day either. What are the chances of that happening? If by chance he was at either of the places he claimed to be, he's got some really terrible luck. But if he wasn't at either of the places when he claimed to be, I want to say that that would mean he had good luck, but... Spoiler alert, this story does not turn out favorably for Doug, so I guess I can't really say that he has good luck, 
But man, it is definitely wild that all of these security cameras happen to not be working on that day specifically. Anyways, without the ability to confirm or refute Doug's alibis and their knowledge that he had been the last person known to see Jenna before her body was found, police really started to zero in on the possibility that Jenna's own stepfather could be responsible for her murder. And with no other evidence, leads, or ideas, they took that theory and they ran with it. They dove balls deep into investigating Doug and trying desperately to link him to Jenna's murder. The problem was, no matter how suspicious they were of him or how deeply they believed that Doug might be guilty, they didn't have Jack diddly squat as far as evidence went to prove it. They didn't have any incriminating DNA or hair samples on Jenna's body. There was no blood or evidence of any kind in Doug's car, but there was also no reason for them to believe that Doug's car had recently been cleaned in an effort to conceal evidence. I mean, they really had, like, nothing. The only thing they had recovered from the car that seemed even remotely out of place was some unique plant matter they found on the undercarriage. Obviously, there's some debris that you would expect to find under a vehicle, like dirt and grass and pebbles and such, but the yellowish plant material that police had taken from under Doug's car turned out to be a weed called star thistle. And considering the fact that star thistle is a rangeland weed, which means that it's most commonly found on grasslands, shrublands, woodlands, wetlands, and deserts, it's not a plant that you'd expect to find on the underside of a vehicle. Unless, of course, that vehicle had recently been driving off-road through one of the aforementioned areas. You know, like one might do in an attempt to dump a body. And I know what you're thinking. Like, okay, Jessica, that's a stretch. And to that I say, you're right, it is. Sure, um, star thistle was found in the area that Jenna's body was discarded, but even so, it's not even kind of an uncommon weed in California. It's actually pretty invasive and covers over 12 million acres statewide. So basically like 7% of the state is covered in the stuff. So it's absolutely a huge leap to assume that just because some weeds were found on Doug's car that were also found near where Jenna's body was found, he must be responsible for her death. But fair warning, if you're disappointed by that, you are really not gonna like some of the um, evidence that's coming up. But before I stray too far, let me finish up with the star thistle conversation because I don't wanna get too ahead of myself. Lord knows if anyone can get off track to the point of no return, it's me. Actually, let me take a break, regroup, put on my lashes, and when we come back, we'll get into the star thistle and everything else. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so this star thistle. If it's so common, how is it even possible that they could try to classify finding it under his car as evidence? Well, forensic botany, that's how. Investigators contracted the help of plant taxonomist Dr. Fred Rusha, who took the samples that had been found under Doug's vehicle and compared them to the samples that had been recovered from Jenna's body. And through some very complex scientific practices that I'm not even going to embarrass myself by trying to regurgitate right now, Dr. Rusha was able to determine that the yellow star thistle that had been pulled from Doug's car was at the exact same developmental stage as the yellow star thistle that had been pulled from Jenna's body. And while, sure, this might make someone stop and go, hmm, it's not exactly a smoking gun, not even close. So investigators decided to move on and try and determine what could have left the postmortem marks on Jenna's thighs. If they could figure out what made the marks, maybe it would help them figure out which direction to take their investigation next. Now, it was immediately obvious to everyone that the marks had likely been made by the pressure of a man-made object. According to Dr. Robert Lawrence, one of the pathologists that worked on Jenna's case, the marks were, quote, clearly of a shape and appearance that would not normally be found in nature, unquote. And after doing some brainstorming, Detective Hans Bosma had kind of a light bulb moment. He had a very strong feeling that the marks on Jenna's leg had been made by the top of a seatbelt buckle. However, rather than announce this hypothesis to his colleagues or, you know, 
the community at large, he kept it to himself. Because instead of possibly having people agree with him due to the pure power of suggestion, Detective Bosma wanted to see if perhaps anyone else would like independently come to the same conclusion he had without him first planting the idea in their head. So he sent Jenna's autopsy to a man named Gary Robertson, who was an expert in photogrammetry. And um, Gare Bear took incredibly precise measurements of the markings. And with those measurements, he was able to create a 3D model of what he believed had made the marks on Jenna's leg. His conclusion? Well, after reviewing the 3D rendering spit out by his computer software, Gary believed that the marks on Jenna's leg had likely been made by the top of a seatbelt buckle. <laughs> what? You have to admit, it's pretty wild that completely independently from one another, these two men came to the exact same conclusion about what had made the postmortem marks on Jenna's leg. And to even further test their theory, Detective Bosma and Mr. Robertson decided to conduct a little experiment in Doug's car. They got a model that was roughly the same height and weight as Jenna to lay in the back of the car in the same position that they believed that Jenna would have been placed had she'd been transported in that car. They could figure this out because Doug drove a hatchback and one of his back seats was broken. So there was really only one way that would have made sense for Jenna to have been placed in the car if she had been. So the model laid down and laid that way for about 15 minutes, which was the approximate amount of time it would have taken Doug to drive from his home to the location that Jenna's body had been dumped. Then when the 15 minutes was up, they photographed the model's leg so that the marks could be compared to the marks that had been left on Jenna's legs. And when the photos were compared, investigators thought that the resemblance between them was pretty compelling. And when measurements were taken, the marks apparently matched down to like the millionth of a meter. And that was it. With those two pieces of evidence alone, Doug Mauser was arrested in 1997 and charged with the murder of his stepdaughter. His trial began in mid-1999 with the prosecution theorizing that Doug had attacked Jenna in a fit of rage after discovering that she was on the phone, even though she was supposed to be grounded. It was believed that at first he had just rendered her unconscious, but that once he kind of processed what had happened, he freaked out at the idea of potentially being charged with child abuse. Because remember, he had that high level security clearance job at a federal research lab. So a conviction of that nature or any conviction really could dramatically impact his job, if not jeopardize it altogether. So I guess they thought that ultimately he came to the conclusion that he had no other choice. He had to kill Jenna to conceal what he'd done and protect his job, which makes total sense. Anytime I don't wanna get caught for doing something, I absolutely do something 10 times worse that I'm also probably gonna get caught for. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. To substantiate this theory, the prosecution presented the jury with the few pieces of evidence they had. They explained to the jury that not only had they been unable to verify Doug's alibi, but that it had actually been refuted by two separate people. The security guard who'd denied seeing him enter or exit the premises that day, which we already talked about. But on top of that, Doug's boss was unable to locate any evidence that Doug had logged into his work computer at all the day that Jenna was killed. Beyond that, obviously, Fred Rusha and Gary Robertson spoke to their respective scientific opinions regarding the star thistle and the photogrammetry. But I think one of the most, if not the most compelling thing that they presented to the jury was a really weird conversation between Jenna's mom and brother that had been recorded. During which Jaron asked Kathy if Doug had murdered Jenna and Kathy responded, quote, well, you know how Jenna was, unquote. I'm sorry, ma'am, but what in the living hell is that supposed to mean? Do you mean that because Jenna was a brat, Doug was justified if he did kill her? I'll tell you what, I don't like that. I don't like it one bit. By that logic, my parents would have been justified in taking my ass out from about 2006 to 2011 because your girl was an asshole. But wouldn't you know it, here I sit, because rebellion, aggression, oppositional defiant disorder, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter because nothing justifies murder. Anyways, when Doug's defense attorney got his chance to speak, 
he tried to convince the jury that the prosecution's case was weak, that their evidence was circumstantial, their forensics were bullshit, basically that they were <laughs> reaching like motherfucking Stretch Armstrong to connect some of the dots they were trying to connect to prove their case. I believe an exact quote from Doug's defense attorney following the trial was, quote, they didn't theorize shit. I'd say it on a screen and I'd even say it in a courtroom. They didn't have fucking any theory other than he threw the body. He killed her and threw it over the side and that she was in his car because of the mark on her leg. That's all there was, unquote. Instead, he theorized that after Doug left for work, Jenna had snuck out of the house and was killed by someone else. Following closing arguments, the jury was excused for deliberation. And after six days, they returned and found Douglas Scott Mauser guilty of second degree murder. He was subsequently sentenced to 15 years to life. He did try to appeal his conviction in 2004, but his attempt was denied. Just like every single attempt he's made at getting paroled has been. He's applied for parole, I think like three or four times, but has been denied every time due to the fact that he continues to maintain his innocence. The parole board has all but said that until he's willing to admit what he did and take responsibility for his actions, that he can just continue to sit his happy ass in prison. But even so, Doug, who's now 62, continues to deny that he had anything to do with Jenna's death. And therefore, he remains incarcerated at Valley State Prison in Chowchilla, California to this day. Richard Herman, Doug's defense attorney, later classified Doug's case as the biggest failure of his life. Not career, life. During a sit down interview for the show Forensic Files, he even stated, quote, this shakes my whole foundation of practicing criminal law. This is a tragedy for the family and a tragedy for justice, unquote. I mean, look at him. Homeboy was pissed. Shoot, if this was the biggest failure of his whole life, he'd probably still pissed. As for the prosecution, um, Bridget Flager actually flourished after this case. In 2004, she, along with two fellow prosecutors, secured a conviction in a very notorious case. Recognize this guy? Yup, Bridget was indeed one of the three prosecuting attorneys on Scott Peterson's case. And just two years after that big win in 2006, she enjoyed another big win when she was elected district attorney of Stanislaus County, California, a position she continues to hold to this day. But circling back to Jenna's case, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that this case was pretty divisive. People seem to either really deeply believe that Doug is guilty or they like ferociously believe that he's innocent and the prosecution's case was bullshit. Basically everywhere I turned while I was researching this case, it seemed like people were arguing about whether or not Doug was guilty. Sadly, Jenna's brother passed away in 2015 and even on his obituary page, people were arguing over Doug's guilt or innocence, which come on, read the room. It's not the time and it most certainly is not the place. But I think it just goes to show that people were and I guess still are really divided on this one. I personally think that it's pretty likely that he did it, but I don't even think that because of the star thistle or the photogrammetry or any of that. The thing that got me the most, and keep in mind, I'm literally no one and I know nothing, but the phone call between Jenna and Sarah pretty much solidified where I stand. In my opinion, the only explanation for Jenna just abruptly hanging up without a word was because Doug came home and she was trying not to get caught. Think about it. If some random stranger had broken in and attacked Jenna, she would have screamed, which would have indicated to Sarah that something was wrong. And on the other side of that, if Jenna had invited someone over or intended on leaving and whoever she was meeting ended up killing her, like if it was one of those boys she liked, wouldn't she have just told Sarah like, hey, so-and-so's here, I'm gonna have to call you back. Obviously, I don't know anything for sure, but that's just my two cents. That's why I think he did it. Ooh, you know who didn't think he did it? <laughs> Kathy. Yes, Jenna's mother, Kathy. She very much believed in her husband's innocence. So much so that she even moved closer to the prison at one point so that it would be easier for her to visit him. To be fair, I couldn't find anything recent that said definitively whether or not they were still married. So I don't really know where I was going with that. I guess that means it's just time for me to wrap this up because once I start rambling, it's just best to shut it down. Shut it down! Shut it all down! Rest in peace to poor Jenna. I don't know why, but this one 
in particular really gets to me. Maybe it's because I feel like I can relate to her on some levels because I was a pretty rebellious and defiant teenager. You can ask my mom. I think there was a solid four to five years where she really didn't like me that much. She loved me, don't get me wrong, but I was not fun for her to be around. I've apologized, we're all good, but I think that's why it bothers me. To think that Jenna was potentially killed for breaking some rules, just because she was rebelling as a teen doesn't mean that she wouldn't have gotten it together when she got older. And who knows, she could have gone on to live a really successful and really fulfilling life. And it sucks that she'll never get to reminisce on her rebellious years and laugh with her mom about all the dumb shit she did back then. Anyways, let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notifications. I put out new videos every week and I'd love to catch you back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.